a bigger group. Okay. Okay, cool. Whenever you're ready. And I think that might cost a fair. high school teacher uh, for at Rossford High School for 30 years now. In that time, he's taught all of the high school mathematics courses up through and including calculus. Um, he's taught CCP, College Credit Plus, for the University of Finley for 20 years now. Um, and he, his successes have been highlighted in the Toledo Blade. Um, please welcome our speaker, Matt Schlater. Thanks, everybody. And gifts. Ooh, nice. Thank you. Do I open this now? <laughs> Kitty. I'll get it later. All right. I see a few people showed up again. Yeah, I know. You're, and you're still drinking that coffee. Is that a new one or is that the same one? Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. So we had a little interesting morning here. Everything went pretty good. So I'm just going to kind of continue talking about stuff. And at any point you guys want to ask me something, go right ahead. Like I said, I've been teaching math at, um, at the high school level for 30 years. Um, I taught Algebra 1. I taught Geometry. Algebra 2, Pre-Calc, Calculus, um, Applied, Senior Math. So, I mean, I've kind of done it all. Um, usually I have about four preps every year. One year I had five preps. Um, so it gets a little crazy at times. So if there's questions that you have at some point, you know, we'll talk about some math and stuff. But at the end, it's like, if you want to ask me stuff about just the world of education, you know, we can talk about that too. You just don't have to talk about math stuff. So there you go. Um, I'm going to show you this video here in a minute, but just, let's just talk here for a second. Um, so if you're with us first or, uh, this morning, we were kind of talking about this idea of, inputs and outputs and this basic concept when it comes to the, the idea of algebra. So if I showed you this, most of you have something that comes into your head. All right? If you've ever been in a math class, you're like, oh, that's what? You can say it. I'm waiting. What is it? What comes in your head? The Cartesian plane. Ooh, those are fancy words. I wasn't expecting that. 
What's another, what's another thing? Make the addition sign, yeah. That's plus. Okay. The XY coordinate system, yeah. Cartesian coordinate. I mean, literally, we, as, as math people, we kind of live by this. All right? It's like the whole idea is like we, we love to look at data. We love to look at what, what is math doing in our life. And we've kind of come down to this thing right here as helping us visualize what's going on in our world, okay? The first, second, third, the fourth quadrant, okay? And we plot these points on here. And when you were, you know, when you were in an eighth grade, they said, hey, where's three comma two? And you went, okay, three to the right, and you went two up, and you did that. And maybe you had a math teacher who said, hey, let's play Battleship. You ever have, one? You ever have a math teacher that did that, played Battleship with you with this? Seriously? No? So you, you would get a, coordinate, a Cartesian coordinate system, and you'd put, your, you'd put your ships on there, and then you'd take turns going around the room, and they'd say, oh, three comma two, and you'd have to say if you got, your ship got hit. I used to do that okay? when I used to teach algebra one, try to teach the Cartesian coordinate system. And how many people you remember doing that, but you really didn't know what you're doing? I mean, you knew that you had to go three to the right and two up. What did it mean? Like, what, what, so what? What was happening there? What was a representation of what's going on with, with, in our life? Maybe that three really meant something, and then that two really meant something. So at some point, a three was occurring. And the result of that three produced a two. Mm. It meant something to somebody somewhere. And so this morning, we were talking about this idea of a function. Okay, and the very first function we learned was though the, our, you know, it was like our security blanket, y equals mx plus b, okay? We felt good about that. We used it all the time. We loved it, okay? And then at some point we got fancy, we didn't use y anymore, and we used f of x, okay? And we started to get this idea that, hey, there's an input to something. And then when we put in this input, there's a certain output that occurs. Okay. So as I'm going to show you this. And as we're watching this, I want you to think about that idea. Like, what's my input and what's my output? What do I want to, what do I, what do I know? And there's a, is there a result happening because of what I know? And there's, is there a mathematical reason on why it's happening? So here, let's just watch this. We might have to watch it a couple times. Now, this is me. I did this like 15 years ago. As you can tell, actually, I burned it on a DVD. No one even does that anymore. Using an Apple product. These little icons even still there. So I used this in my Calc 1 class. But we can, you don't have to be in Calc 1 to understand what's going on here. We'll, we'll talk about it. So let's see. All the faster the car would go. Okay. All right, I probably got some questions. All right, you better work. Oh. I should have got pulled over, I got a ticket there. There's no doubt about it. I have, like, first of all, like, like if you're watching that, if you're watching that, Who's got a question? Because I always have this question every time I show that. Someone always asks me this. Nobody? Nobody was curious on how I even did that? Because think about what I had to do. 
I was holding a what? A phone with a stopwatch on it. And I had to be holding what else? Yeah, he gets it. He's like, what? What else was I holding? Something else to record it. I barely remember, like, someone asked me one time, how'd you do that? And I was looking at that going, uh, I guess I was driving with my knees, okay? Yeah, so for, the, for math, I did this, okay? Let's go for math. So let's think about what I did here. What's the, what was the input? This whole idea of a function, this idea of f of x, there's something going on up there. Stop it here. So I'm going to stop it out of place. What's that right there? Time, what else? And what's that? The start. So at time what? Starting time, what's time? At this moment, time is what? Zero, okay? So we're turning, starting with time zero. So at time zero, what's going on at time zero? What's so special that's happening in this picture at time zero? Is anything happening at time zero? Or is there nothing happening? I'll wait you out. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So at time zero, there's something going on. I'm going about 12 mile an hour. Exactly. Okay. So just to refresh you a little bit. Now, this is not y equals mx plus b. But let's just think that for a second. Let's go back to algebra 1, y equals mx plus b. And let's think about this. So the x is the input, OK? In this case, the input is time. If I put 0 in for time here, what's 0 times m? That's going to be what? 0. Then 0 plus this value has to be our output. So 0 plus, what is that initial? Velocity, he said it over here, it was what? 12, yeah. So at time zero, we had an output of 12. That's a what on that? That's a point, exactly. There's something occurring at zero comma 12. I can put a point right here at zero comma 12. What's that? Another what? Another point. Exactly. Okay. There's another input and there's another output occurring there. Could we plot that position on our beloved Cartesian coordinate system? Sure. Yep. Yeah. We can plot that point. How many times could I do this? Yeah. Because how many, how many moments of time, does anyone remember what the last time was when I hit stop? I don't even remember. Zero to like, this is a test. You, if you know, I'll let you go right now. I can leave early. <laughs> was it 26.7? All right, we'll go with that. We're going to find out. So between zero and 26.7 moments of time, how many, how many places can I divide that up into? That, those, that moment in time, I can divide it up into how many individual moments? A lot, right? Because we're like, well, wait, well what about 0.5 seconds? I'll, I'll wanna, I'll wanna, I'm interested in that. But there's 0.51, there's 0 0.501, 0 0.50. There's an infinite number of positions. So if I said, why don't you graph all the points between 0 and 26.7 seconds, uh, that would take a lot of time if we wanted to graph all the points. So what do we do? We don't graph all of them. What do we do?
Should we just grab some of them? Yeah, just pick some. Okay. Now, obviously, the more we pick, the better we're going to be off. So we can say, okay, we'll start it. We'll stop it again. There's another point. And we could continue to do this. Okay. And we could come up with time is going in. And then what was this over here? Independence time. In independent. The dependent. What's coming out? What was it again? Give me a word. Velocity, yeah. So time's going in, velocity's coming out. So time's going in. Eventually, we started with zero seconds here, and here, 26 point whatever, seven seconds, right? That's what you said. So at 26.7 seconds, what was the velocity there? You remember? It was zero, right? It stopped the car. It was zero right there. Does anybody remember the maximum velocity? I bet you remember that one. Is eight? Like, yeah, you remember that one. You're like, woo, he's going so fast. So at some point, I hit 80. Did that happen at a specific time somewhere between 0 and 26.7? Had to happen somewhere, right? You saw it. So somewhere, time was going by. Velocity was increasing. I maxed out at 80, and then eventually, I went back to a velocity of 0. So your independent was time. Your dependent was velocity. It's a function, okay? This is a velocity function. So like if we were, you know, if you're in physics, like we, physics is good. So this is a V of T function. We're inputting velocity or inputting time and we want our velocity. Okay. So I give this, I give, I give this video to my Calc 1 students at the end of the year, kind of like when we're done. And I show them the video and I walk out of the room. Well, before I walk out, I say, Tell me how far the car goes, and I leave. And they have to figure it out. And they can just work on it together. Now, if you've been in Calc 1, you kinda under, you, you're like, okay, I know what to do. I, I know this problem. If you haven't been in Calc 1, that's okay, because we can still kind of figure this out, how far the vehicle actually traveled. Well, how far did it go? Okay, so let's think about this. How far did this car go? Well, here, let's bring a little physics in for a second. V, velocity, equals, what's the little basic physics formula? A lot of you probably know it. Go ahead, shout it out. You don't know? Don't go. Yeah, you do. Velocity, it's a ratio of what over what? How far you went and how long it took you, right? Distance over time. Okay? I told my students I wanted them to figure out what? I said, figure this out, and I walked out of the room. What did I tell them to figure out? How far did the car go? Yep, what's the distance? I said, find this right here. Okay, all you algebra mathletes out there, what are you going to do to solve for D? Multiply both sides by what? T. So if I multiply both sides by T, okay, my distance equals velocity times time. Now, let's make sure we get this. So velocity... Okay. Come here. Velocity, what is a unit of measure of velocity? Remember, velocity is a ratio. It's something compared to something. So give me an example of velocity. Blank per blank. You do it every day. If you drive a car, you look at your what? And it's in a ratio, and it's in, it's telling you your what, what per what. There you go. See, it's not a trick question. Miles per hour, okay? So your velocity is in miles per hour. And I'm going to take that times what? A time. What happens if you take miles per hour times hours. Now, you guys know this. A lot of you know this. Some of you might like, what's he doing? Dimensional analysis. You guys remember that? K 
chemistry, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd moles, and you did stuff with that. I can't remember. It's been so long. We did all the dimensional analysis stuff. What's going to happen to the hours? They're canceled. Right. And I'll be left with miles. So to figure out how far I went, I have to take velocity times time. It works. Why is that not going to work here, though? Because velocity isn't constant. Right. The velocity is always changing. Like, this formula, velocity times time, works great. The problem is, is velocity isn't consistent. If I, if I just got in the car and I put the cruise on 50 miles per hour, and I said, let's go 50 miles an hour for an hour. So I could go 50 miles per hour times one hour. The hours cancel. We traveled how far? 50 miles, right? That's, that's easy. The pro where it gets weird is because this velocity isn't constant. That's the weird part. All right, back over here. You guys see it? You guys get cheated. Here, I'm going to come over here for a little bit. That's velocity, okay? Miles per hour, okay? Miles per hour. What's this down here? What's that? That was time, right? That was hours. Who knows how to find the area of a rectangle in here? Oh, you know that, right? How do you find the area of a rectangle? That's third grade. You know what? She's like, I know this one. I know this. Length times width, right? Look at this right here. And look at that right there. I want you to take the y-axis times the x-axis. What happens when you take miles per hour times hours? What do you get? Miles per hour times hour. What happens? We did it over there. The hours cancel, right? We just get miles. So here's what's kind of crazy. If I took the y-axis times the x-axis, that would give me a distance traveled. The problem is, here, this would be the easy way. Let me show you the easy way first. So here I got my hours, okay? And here I got my miles per hour. And let's say this was my function. So let's say that was 50. So I'm going 50 miles an hour, but I put the cruise on. And I did this, let's say, for 30 minutes. So. If I want to know how far I went, I could take 50 miles per hour times my half an hour. 25, right? Okay, you watching? Don't fall asleep. I want to take this right here, which was 50. I'm going to make that rectangle. How do we find the area of a rectangle? Length times width. 50 times 0.5. What's the area of that rectangle? 50 times 0.5, it's what? 25. So that space in that rectangle is 25. But more importantly, what's the unit? 25 what's? You know it. Just go ahead and say it. I need input. Miles per hour times hour. What do we get? Miles. So this space in there is 25 miles. So this area of this rectangle is simple. If I'm going 50 miles an hour consistently, and I want to know how much space is in there, all i got to do is take this length times that width. It gives me the space. Miles per hour times hours. I went 25 miles. That's the distance traveled. The problem is 
That isn't a what. That's not a what. That was nice, because it was just a what. This nice rectangle length times width, find the area, boom, there's my distance. The problem is, that's not a nice rectangle. Okay? So if I can figure out how much space is inside this area, that's the distance traveled by the vehicle. Because isn't miles per hour times hours still going to give us distance traveled? Yes. So I need to figure out how much space is in there. But it's this weird shape. It's like, I didn't learn how to find that area, that space, when I was in third grade. It did, it, no, it didn't exist. Okay. So how do we do this? Well, maybe we just don't find all the area at once. Maybe we find a little piece of it. And then find another little piece. And find another little piece. So if I took, take that area and break it up into pieces, then what would I do with all the pieces then? You find the total area. You just do what? Add them up, yeah. You just add up the pieces. So let's take this and break this up into pieces. And let's figure out what the sum of all those pieces are. So here's what we could do. I could take this time right here, and I could break this up into a section. I'm like, let's just figure out that piece. Now, what's interesting, though, is that piece, that rectangle, is it truly the space underneath the curve? Or is it a little bit off? It's not quite there. It's close. So what could I do to that rectangle to get a better accurate answer of area underneath that curve. Make the rectangle what? Skinny. Yeah, skinny it up. Exactly. So if I made that rectangle skinny, that would give us a better accurate of the area underneath the curve. Now, if you, if you haven't taken calculus, you're like, okay, what's this guy talking about? If you have taken it, you're like, oh man, I remember doing this. And I remember it for one day, and then I forgot it. Because all I, did, all I did was what after it? You just did the integral rules, exactly, okay? So we just went ahead and we were like, listen. So the prof got up there, because they, they, what, what do professors love to do? I don't have a doctorate, I'm just a high school math teacher. But I remember being at, in college taking math classes. What do math professors love to do? And you're going, oh, not again. What do they love to do? <laughs> as soon as they say it, you're going to be like, yep. Oh, they love to prove things. Yes. <laughs> Let's prove it. And you're sitting there going, just what? Just tell me how to do this. Just tell me how to do it. Just show me the rule, and I'll do the rule. Okay? And the, do the rules work? Oh, yeah, they work great. And for people who are math-oriented, we love the rules, okay? Because we can do that rule, and <laughs> we can just hammer that thing out. And we can kind of memorize our way through it. And it, and it works. I mean, I've, I've been there. I did the same exact thing, okay? And a lot of your professors at some point probably did the same too, where it's like, okay, this is kind of beyond me. I just need to memorize my rules so I can move on to the next thing. So this is the idea called integration. It's the whole second half of Calc 1, okay? So the first half, half of Calc 1 was what we did this morning. This is basically the second half of Calc 1, right? Um, and this is where people really start to struggle is with the whole integration process because there's a lot of rules. Yeah. So when you flip open that Calc book and you look at the front of it and there's like integration rules, and there's like, why is there 100 rules of integration here? Nah, there's a lot of them. You know, if you take, you know, Calc 3 and differential equations, you get to that point, you start learning some of those rules. I've I got to be honest, I have learned them and forgot them 20, 30 years ago. I don't remember how to do them anymore because I just, I just don't use them enough. 
So a lot of that stuff is gone. But this right here, this is the foundation of everything that works with the idea of integration in calculus. All right, now let me show you something else. Oh, by the way, well, no, I'll bring this back up. Okay, so this is a much better visual of what I was trying to show you guys than my terrible drawing over there. So this idea of the area underneath the curve, guys, when you do this, when you get to this point when you're thinking the area underneath the curve, you need to think dimensions. You need to think I am multiplying something times something. And not just two numbers, but two dimensions. I'm taking miles per hour times an hour. That gives me a mile. I'm taking, if I'm in business calculus, I'm taking um, profit per month times a month, which will give me a total profit. So that idea of those dimensions are so important. So if, you're, if I'm looking at this up here, so if I want to find the area, Underneath this curve, as you can see, I've broken it up into rectangles. Can we find the area of every one of those rectangles? Can we do it? We all, know, we all know length times width, right? So I can go length times width. I can find the area of every one of those rec rectangles. Is that the area underneath the curve, though? It's close, but it's not really perfect. If I want to know how far I traveled in the car, if I want the perfect answer, I need to find the perfect area underneath the curve. Not kind of. I want the perfect area underneath the curve. So how could we do that? Now, if you've been in Calc, you know what to do. So I got one, two, three, four, five. I got six rectangles. If I wanted to get a better area, don't say it if you know it. I want everyone to think. Well, hey, if I wanted a better area underneath the curve, could do this. Make more what? Say it. Rectangles. Yeah. I could make more rectangles. Now, that creates some more work because then I got to add up more what? Rectangles. I'm like, okay, I got to add up more rectangles. So that's fine. So right now I got six rectangles up there. Well, let's make some more. Let's make 11. Now, that area, it's still not perfect, but it's better than it was before. Well, I'll make more rectangles. I'll make some more. I'll make some more. Now, this right here, this number, that's the sum underneath the curve. So what happens? Here, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back. I'm going to make, make one rectangle. Okay? So there's one rectangle. Is that accurate? Not even close. Okay? So right now it says the area underneath that curve is 27. Think, the t distance traveled was 27 miles. We took miles per hour times miles. Let's pretend that that was our equation for our velocity function. And we got 27 miles for a distance. Then, like, you know what? I don't like that. I want more. I'll go 2, 4, 5. Now it's 11.8. Now it's, I'll just keep dragging it. Just keep going and going and going and going and going and going and going. This accurate continues to get what? That area, the more rectangles I make, allows the area underneath the curve to become more what? Accurate. There you go. I saw you. <laughs> How many rectangles would I have to put there to get the perfect area underneath the curve? Should I go 239? Would that be good enough? Right. I'd have to put an infinite number. I'd have to do this. I'd have to apply an undefinable thing again to make the math work. Yeah. Okay. So 
I can allow those rectangles to go to infinity, and then the area underneath that curve becomes more and more perfect. Okay, now, if you're not in Calc 1, someday you may be there. And if you are in Calc 1, or, be, or been there, that's great. But eventually you saw this, right? This is what we just did. 27.7? 26.7? Okay. So I want to know how far we went between 0 to 26.7 seconds. I don't know how far we went. And then you saw something like this. I remember seeing that for the longest time. I remember taking all of Calc 1, and I did not get it. I did the rules. Man, I did the rules. And I got a B in Calc, B in Calc 1. I did the rules. I never got that. I just didn't understand it. But this comes back to this, this idea of f of x. Let's go back to this. Matter of fact, even more basic. Let's go back to this, our Cartesian coordinate system. We call this x, and we call this y. And eventually we got fancy, and we called that x, and we called that f of x. So f of x was what's coming out of the function. That's what's coming out of the function. That's the y value coming out. And then here, what's the d represent, physics people? D represents what? I heard it. You can say it. Delta. D delta. What does that mean? Say it. Say it. Change. There you go. Change. This is change in X. Change in X? So you're telling me that that was take your change in x, the change in x, that's the width of the rectangle that we're working with, times the what? The f of x. Length, or length times width, width times length, whatever, same thing. So what this is right here, that's just the area of a rectangle. That's just... How tall is a rectangle? How tall is a rectangle? How wide is the rectangle? This is what this is doing. Now there's a lot more to this because we can prove why this works. We can do a whole summation thing, the summation symbol, sum up the rectangles as number of rectangles go to infinity. You learned that one time, you forgot it, and then just did the integration rule. But that's what's going on right there. When you do this, when you do that, you're just letting this go forever. Wow. So how do you think my students finished that project? I want to know how far it went. And I want to know how many feet they went. I want to know how far the car went in feet, too. Here, I'll pull it back up on the screen. So this is, this is playing along here. Now they're, they're start, they stop, and they start, and they stop, and they start, and they stop. So basically, they're doing what they learned when they were in eighth grade in Algebra 1. The first thing they were doing was what? Finding a bunch of what? Yep, they're finding data. They're finding x comma y's, x comma y's, x comma y's. They did that first, okay? That's eighth grade Algebra 1. Then, what did they do? They 
spotted it, right? They made a picture, okay? And then they t they've taken enough calculus now to know that they have to find the area underneath that curve to find the distance traveled. They have to take the miles per hour on the y-axis times the time on the x-axis. They know they have to do that. And there was rules that they could do that with. There's a huge problem here, though, that they have to deal with. Because all the rules of integration work as long as I give you the what. This works as long as you have the what. Yeah, you have to have this to apply the rules. What's the function for that? I didn't give it to them. Exactly. So how are they going to come up with a function that represents that data so they can do this? Some of you have probably done it before. How, how are you going to do this? Or what are you going to use to do it with? Will a T-84 do this? Yeah, it will. So if you took a TI-84, you could input the data into a TI-84, okay? You could put the points in. You could put the X comma Y, input, output, input, output, input, output, okay? And then you could actually tell the calculator, like, hey, what kind of function makes this data points? And the calculator will come up with some kind of equation that represents those data points. And I mean, it's a TI-84. That's been around for a long time. I mean, that's archaic compared to some of the stuff that we have now. But it does it, okay? And then, so now they got this. They have a function that they came up with using technology to help them come up with that function. Because here's the deal, folks. In, re in the real world, the rules of calculus are simple. They're just rules. The hard part is not knowing the rules of math. That's easy. The hard part is coming up with this. What is the reality that I want to apply math to? That's the hard part. Because that takes a lot of time and a lot of research to come up with a function that represents what we think is right. And then what happens is, has, ever, has science ever changed? We said, oh, yeah, well, we thought it was that, but mm, now, it's, now it's something else. Does that happen? Sure, because it happens because what we thought was the right function isn't the right function anymore. How in the world can we think that a function was correct and all of a sudden becomes different as part of our life has gone by? We thought that, we thought that when we inputted this number, this would always come out. Why does that change? Because what goes by and we can't stop it. You can't stop this. What goes by? Time. Time continues on. And as time continues on, guess what happens? Holy crap, did you see this? At this moment in time, this is different now. That changes the entire function. So what we thought was right was now, well, we have to adjust the function now because this is throwing off our data. So we come up with this new function, and then we apply our rules of math to that function. And applying the integration rule, that's simple. It's coming up with that piece of that function. And that's when, that's why I like to show this to my calc students at the end of the year, because this is where it gets real. This is where, like, okay, there isn't just a bunch of people sitting in a room somewhere taking integrals all day long. That doesn't exist. Why? You've been taking, you've taken all, you've taken all these math classes. Integration, double integration, triple integration, no, 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 no. Why isn't just people just do that for a living? What's going to do it? AI is going to do it. Computer is going to do it. A program is going to do it. Exactly, okay? I talked with the nuclear engineer at Davis Betsy one time. I don't live too far away from there, and I ran into him. At, I was at an event. And actually, um, with my daughter, we were sitting at this event. We got to talking, and he was like, he was like yeah, I'm an engineer. I'm like, oh, really? I go, well, how often do you use calculus? He's like, never. He goes, if I did, he goes, if I did math by hand, I would be fired. He goes, we can't risk taking, making a mistake 
mathematically. So we have programs and you know all kinds of stuff that does all the heavy lifting for the math. He goes, I haven't taken an integral or a derivative in a long... Matter of fact, if I would show him this, if I'd have showed him that as we were sitting there, he'd have been like, holy crap, I forgot all about that. He would have, he, he's, he's like, yeah, I did that like 20 years ago, but he goes, I haven't done it so long. He goes, he probably would have forgot the power rule because he didn't have to do it. So, it's, <laughs> so you guys are all saying, then why are we doing this? <laughs> why are we doing this? Okay? If, if something else is going to do it for us, why should we sit here and go through all these math classes? She's like, she, I can see something. She's like, yeah. What, she, yeah, he's right. Why are we doing this? Is there a point? Well, is it nice to know at least where something came from? The foundation of something? I mean, it's important. Because here's the deal, and I see this all the time. All the time. Mr. Slaughter, Photomath said this. <laughs> I'm like, that's great. And Photomath did exactly what you told it to do. But you have a parenthesis in the wrong place. And Photomath is doing what you told it to do. You're right, it's not wrong. The problem is, you don't have enough common sense to know that you're millions off. You're not even remotely close to what's going on. Okay? So we have to have some kind of foundation to know what we're talking about. Because at some point, if AI just tells you, hey, this is your answer, we kind of have to question things every once in a while. Like, in, okay, well, that seems really off. Let's check that again. So it's important to have this foundational work, even though, yes, at some point, there's going to be a lot of stuff that's going to do it for us. But it's nice to know that, man, something's really thrown off there. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Mm -hmm. right. So yeah, that's how they ended up getting that. Then they actually put all the data in the TI-84. Then they came up with an equation for that. And here's what's crazy. The TI-84 will actually do what else for you if you want it to. Anybody know? It'll take a derivative and it'll do what? It'll actually find the area underneath the curve. You can tell it. Like, in, hey, can you find the area underneath the curve between 0 and 26.7 seconds? It'll just tell you, yeah, here it is. This is the area, done. Yeah, it'll do it. And that's just a basic thing that's been around for years and years and years. There's nothing special about it. I'm sure there's a lot more advanced things out there that I don't even know about. All right. Anybody got any questions about anything? We're about 10 minutes here till we get out of here. No? Now, if, who, who's seen this before? No? Really? Okay. Who's going to take, who's in Calc 1 right now? Or been in Calc? Who's taking Calc? Who's, okay. Who's going to, yeah, I know you two did. Who's going to take it? Eventually. Okay. So someday you're going to take, you were in here first, or first hour too, or the beginning of the day. At some point, you're going to take Calc 1. And all the stuff I was talking about, I hope you're like, whoa, I remember that guy from Rockford. He was talking about this stuff. Okay? And basically, you just took Calc 1 today. First, beginning of the day, and at the afternoon. This is Calc 1. It's there. Obviously, there's going to be a lot more work involved. Okay? But that's the foundation of Calc 1, is doing these two things I did this morning and this afternoon. Yeah. And here's what's really interesting, too. Every time I teach this idea, I, I, still, I still don't understand. Why is this even working? Okay? Because my mind is, it's, it's okay. But honestly, the, the doctors of math in this, in this room and in this university, I mean... Credit to them. They have worked tremendously to understand some of the math that they understand. And it still blows my mind sometimes that this actually works. Like, it's working. And there's times where I'm sitting there, I'm thinking about it, and I just stop thinking about it. I just accept that it works because it hurts my head to continue to think about it. Like, great, I'm glad it works, and I'm just glad someone else already thought about it because I'm done. But it's really cool, though. I mean, it's, it's just really neat.
So anyway. Okay, questions about just the teaching field? Mr. Slaughter, did you ever break up a fight? Yes. <laughs> did you catch some kids vaping in the bathroom? Yes. We good? Yeah. They were pretty, actually, they were really good. Yeah, they, I was impressed. Um, because it's really interesting, because I just walk out of the room. I don't even want to be in the room. Because if you're in the room, they just want to, like, they just want to hound you with questions. So I just walk out and leave them. Now, I let them work together as a group, so they just kind of, like, talk to each other. And amazing, they always kind of figure it out. Now, if I just probably give this to one of them and walked away, I'm sure there could be some struggles. But because there's a group of 15 to 20 of them, they usually come down pretty good. I think, if I remember right, I went close to like 2,600 feet or something like that, 3,000. I can't remember. I have to do it again. I don't know. But no, I don't recommend this. With, I got done doing this, and I got done. I'm going, man, I, I probably shouldn't have done that. That was probably kind of dangerous. So... If a police officer would see me doing that today, they'd be like, pulled me over. What are you doing? It was math. It was math. It was all for math. Don't give me a ticket. <laughs> all right. I got nothing else unless you guys got something else. I'm all spent. Was it? Oh, was it? I don't know. You want to see? Okay, so you're curious. All right, here we go. I don't know if that was the end. Oh, it was 26.3. There you go. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.